worthy of every song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Jesus, the name above every other name Jesus, the only one who could ever save Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Oh, we live for you Every song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Oh, we live for you Jesus, the name above every other name Jesus, the only one who could ever save Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Oh, we live for you Holy, there is no one like you There is none beside you Open up my eyes Your heart and lead me in your love.
Father, show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. of Jesus Christ on Easter. We celebrate because the resurrection is the proof that Jesus is the true King and has authority over all things. When we obey Jesus, we live the life that He has for us. The second week, we looked at how God's love reigns over our past. Though our mistakes and sin can be a heavy burden, we embrace the love that God has for us offers us a fresh start. Last week we discovered that God's love gives us promise for our present. We can make choices that create healthy patterns in our lives and renew our minds to live in obedience to God. Well this final week of our series I want to speak about allowing the love of God to reign over our future. As a child I remember playing a little game that was supposed to help us know what the future held. You probably remember these things. It's actually called a fortune teller. You remember these little origami paper games that you used to play? So basically what happens is there's yellow, blue, green, and red. And so it's a, it's a game that you play with a friend. So you ask your friend to choose a color. Let's say they choose blue, B-L-U-E. Do you remember that? Then they have to choose a number inside. We've got one, two, five, or six. So maybe they choose two. One, two. Then they get to choose another number again. This time, let's say five. And then you open up five and it tells you your fortune. It says, you'll meet the person of your dreams tomorrow. <laughs> well, we have all wondered from time to time what the future might hold for us. Sometimes we wonder because we're living through something painful and we can't wait until we get to the other side of that difficulty. Sometimes we wonder because we're excited about all the possibilities that may be ahead for us. Either way, our curiosity about the future can sometimes slip into unhealthy patterns of thinking and give way to worry. I want you to take a piece of paper and a pen. You can hit pause on this message if you need to find a piece of paper or a pen, or you can pull out your phone and go to your notes section in your phone and jot it down there. But I want to invite you to write down one worry that you have, something that you're facing today, one thing that's on your mind that's causing you to worry, and I want you to keep it close, and we're going to come back to it at the end of the message. in a season of great uncertainty, and studies reveal that COVID-19 is having a negative impact on Canadians' mental health, with many seeing their stress levels double 
since the onset of the pandemic. The Center for Addiction and Mental Health is Canada's largest mental health teaching hospital and one of the world's leading research centers in its field. Their findings show people are struggling with fear and uncertainty about their own health and their loved one's health, concerns about employment and finances and social isolation that comes from public health measures such as quarantining and physical distancing. A recent poll found that 50% of Canadians reported worsening mental health since the pandemic began, with many feeling worried and anxious. Similar results were found in a survey of Canadian workers where 81% reported that the pandemic is negatively impacting their mental health, indicating a significant drop in overall worker mental health since the beginning of COVID-19. Substance use is also on the rise in Canada. A recent poll found that 25% of Canadians aged 34 to 54 and 21% of those aged 18 to 34 have increased their alcohol consumption since social distancing and self-isolation due to COVID-19 began. Another study found that Canadians who described their mental health as fair or poor were more likely than those with better mental health to have increased their use of alcohol, cannabis, and tobacco during the early stages of the pandemic. The negative impact of COVID-19 on Canadians' mental health is not surprising given that previous health and economic crises have had similar effects. So let me just say it, everyone worries. And especially right now, it is normal to be experiencing increased levels of stress and anxiety due to the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. The good news for us today is that the Bible offers us a framework to help us understand and appreciate the struggle that is to worry. And what's more, it offers us rich truths that remind us that our God is able to meet us in our struggle, to comfort us, and to walk with us. Before we get into our text, there are a couple of distinctions that need to be made. Well, many of you know that our daughter Julia is studying psychology. When discussing this message, she explained that a level of anxiety is actually a good thing. It can be a positive motivator. An example of this would be a test that's coming up. You might have some anxiety about it. Well, that anxiety causes you to grind out some time to study for the test, and as a result, you get a better mark. Anxiety disorders, on the other hand, occur when anxiety does not result in a positive outcome, but instead becomes debilitating or crippling. I found this fascinating because the Bible also refers to positive and negative anxiety. In the positive sense, it's proper concern, and in the negative, it's problematic, obsessive anxiety. Here are a couple of positive examples. Philippians 2, 19 to 20. Again, positive examples are referring to proper concern. I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, that I also may be cheered when I receive the good news about you. I have no one else like him who takes a genuine interest in your welfare. Philippians 2 verse 28. Therefore, I am all the more eager to send him, so that when you see him again, you may be glad, and I may have less anxiety. 2 Corinthians 11 28. Besides everything else, I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. And now here are some negative examples. In Philippians 4 verses 4 to 9, Paul says, Do not be anxious for anything. In Matthew 6, 25 to 34, as well as Luke 12, 22 to 34, Jesus teaches on worry and clearly tells us this kind of worry is something we should fight against. We're going to look at the Matthew 6 passage in a minute, but before we do, it's important to understand some context. In his teaching of the Beatitudes and the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is teaching about the difference between living for the kingdom of this world and living for the kingdom of God. Essentially, he's teaching us about worldliness, 
And this involves allegiance to things of the world, things that have been created, even good things. This divided loyalty or distraction is what creates worry. Tim Lane says it like this. We begin to experience worry because this world is not substantial enough to produce stability, confidence, and peace. This can happen if you make your health, finances, marriage, children, career, or anything else in creation ultimate in your life. If you look at Jesus' teaching, he talks about making food, clothing, and shelter what you strive after and make most important. Those are examples of good things morphing into what you live for. It is in this context that Jesus says in Matthew 6, 25 verses, um, Matthew 6, verses 25 to 27. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap, nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? Jesus is inviting us into something far greater. He's asking us not to get distracted by the good gifts that he has given us, but instead to put our trust in him, in his sufficiency and his mighty power. God offers proof of his ability to provide for us. He points to the birds of the air. These tiny winged animals are not anxious about their needs for tomorrow, but God still provides for their need today. If God takes care of the sparrows of the world, surely he can take care of you and me. Jesus reminds us of our incredible worth. He sees us. And I would say he also understands how complicated our struggle with worry can be. Science has helped us to understand that there are physiological factors that impact our mental health. Things having to do with the way our brains and our bodies cope and respond to difficulty. Our event and relational history, the political, cultural, socioeconomic context we find ourselves in, our gender, religious upbringing, age, race, or ethnicity all play a role in why some of us struggle with worry more than others. The Bible helps us see that we were created by God to worship him and trust him, regardless of the circumstances that we face. I like the way Tim Lane describes it. He says this in support of the biblical framework. It offers something that no theory of change offers, a personal, loving, redeeming God who becomes a human being, lives, dies, and is raised from the dead to give us new life, wisdom, and power to live in relationship with him. We are loved by God, and therefore he will provide for us today. Our future is in good hands when our future is under God's control. We must allow ourselves to trade what we don't know about the future for what we do know about the love that God has for us. It reminds me of the line in the Lord's Prayer that is prayed in churches all around the world. We pray, give us this day our daily bread. Give us what we need for today, God. Not too much so that we might forget about trusting you for our future. Not too little that we're tempted to try and figure it out on our own, but just enough for today. It's how we learn to trust God, even when we do not know what is around the corner. Trusting God for the future instills deep hope that he is there before we ever even get there. Jeremiah 29 11 says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. God has a preferred future that he longs for you to live. We experience it when we begin to let go of trying to control everything 
and we start to submit to him, to follow his lead. Worrying about the future does not have any positive effects. It only causes us to be paralyzed by fear. The question is, how do you know when opportunities in the future are God's plan? There are three simple questions that you can ask yourself to help you determine God's leading in your life. Number one, does this opportunity align with scripture? Would you be violating some kind of direction that has already been given to us in God's word? If so, there is a good chance that it is not a part of God's plan for you. Number two, will this opportunity make me more like Jesus? If you take part in this activity or make this decision, will it make you more Christ-like? If it will shape you and mold you into the person God desires you to be, then there is a good chance this could be a part of God's plan for your future. Number three, will this opportunity benefit others? Will this decision result in the blessing of other people around you? God is always looking to use willing people to help serve others in need. This may be a good indication that this is the thing that may be a part of God's plan for your life. While Jesus gives us a way to ensure that our future falls in line with his will for our lives, it's about priority. Some of us have our priorities focused on the wrong things because we are nervous about the future. Well, Matthew 6, 28 to 34 says, And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you? O oh, you of little faith! Therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God, and all his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Verse 33 says to seek first the kingdom of God. This should be our priority. Living to see the kingdom of God come to earth should be the defining aspect of our lives. Rather, many of us are focused on increasing our popularity status on social media, finally getting the house on the lake, or finding true love. These things are not bad in themselves, but they can cause us to veer off track as our life progresses. Jesus says, if we seek God first, and everything else has a way of falling into place. When we seek God first, when we come across a new relationship, they are most likely the kind of person that God would want for us. When we seek God first, we live life with humility, and that becomes what we are known for. When we seek God first, our wants and desires look more like the things that God would want for us. Well, we all have so many days in our lives. Our future must be stewarded well. The author of Psalm 90 had this concept in mind when he wrote in verse 12. So teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. The author is writing a prayer. He is asking for awareness so that he uses the days of his life in a manner that honors God and honors people. Do you remember how shocking it was when the iPhone started alerting you to your weekly screen time usage? It measures how much time you spend in the various categories like social, games, productivity, and finance. I still cringe when I look at it because time sure gets away from us when we're on our devices. Well, a survey from a few years ago revealed some astonishing information about how people spend their lives. In a lifetime, the average person will spend six months sitting at stoplights, eight 
eight months opening junk mail. <laughs> one year looking for misplaced objects. I can believe that one. <laughs> Two years unsuccessfully returning phone calls. Four years doing housework. Uh huh. Five years waiting in line. And six years eating. Well, that one's not so bad. <laughs> As we consider these things, it's important to evaluate the way that we spend our time, our energy, our attention, and our affection. This can also be an indicator of what we're living for. And when we begin to fall into excessive worry, let us ask ourselves these important questions. To whom will we look to for security and safety and stability in an unstable world? Where? is our treasure? The answer to these questions will reveal what or who we are living for and why we might be struggling with worry. In light of this, we can return to the truths of God's word where we discover again that God wants to meet us where we are and invites us to put our trust in him. We can allow him to reign over our future. Now this benediction from 2 Thessalonians 2, 16 to 17. May the Lord Jesus Christ himself and our God and Father, who has loved us and given us everlasting consolation and good hope by grace, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. Now remember that piece of paper from the beginning of the message? I want you to flip it over on the side without anything written. I want you to write a prayer about how you want to spend your time and how you want God to turn your worry into worship. May God bless you. Show me who you are and feel